So we are spending our last period on atomic absorption spectroscopy. So this is the instrument upstairs that we use to analyze what types of materials again? Atoms. atoms. Specifically, ooh, that's a good one, organic or inorganic stuff? Inorganic, all the metals, right? Because they're, because they, right, they're going to exist as atoms. You can get iron and digest your samples down and eat up all the organics and all that's left is metals. And then you filter it and put it in the instrument and get an absorbance signal for our atoms. So typically metals, yep, or only metals. Are there different, okay, let's start here. Flame types. So our AA has a flame, and the purpose of the flame was what again, Andy? To raise the energy of the atoms to absorb the frequency? Well, they're in the ground state, so you really don't, there's no raising, you don't need to raise their energy because they're in the ground state. If you got them, if you raised them all out of their ground state, they wouldn't absorb because they, they'd be in their excited state. Okay. So the purpose of the, fern, the purpose of the flame was not that, atomizer to get the atoms in the first place, right? Because everything you make is going to be in solution or something, right? So it's to atomize it, to get it in atoms. It could be an ion. Well, then it's got to somehow generate it and convert it into an atom. It can't even be an ion because an ion is going to have a different absorption spectrum than, a, than the atom would. So everything has to be atoms, neutral atoms. So. What flame type do we use in our AA spectrophotometer? So here's this nice table, Brandy. Now, I don't know if you remember reading the gases on the knobs that you turned. Isn't it like air acetylene? Air acetylene. Very good. Where is that? Here's air acetylene. OK. So it looks like there's a temperature range of that flame. 2100 to 2400 Celsius. Then there's something called a burn velocity. And we'll, we'll get into that. So why would there be different flame types? Hmm. Why would there be different flame types? You even have to change the burner head and things if you change the change the oxidant, like we could use nitrous oxide. We have a burner head for that. We don't have that gas. I think the reason is going to get into later on. Some, some um, materials, some metals are just going to require that higher temperature to atomize them and to generate them into their neutral at atomic state. So we don't have much choice. We're kind of stuck with air acetylene. So. That kind of narrows down our metals, but it's still a huge variety. We should have a, another table that takes, shows all the metals that will handle each oxidant. But burn velocity. We mentioned how acetylene air flame has a burn velocity of 158 to 266 centimeters per second. What do you think that is trying to represent? What would you guess, Al? Burn velocity. Ah, come on. Whoa. I hate these. There's got to be a better way, right? Yeah. Whoa, you hear that? That's not good. It has how fast something. You're right. How fast does the flame conversion happen? Burn You'd think, because burn velocity, you're just thinking of something should be burning, right? But what they're talking about are the gases themselves. In this whole, remember we, we saw this kind of this tube with all these baffles and things that kind of get the big droplets and have them con conglomerate so that most everything goes to waste. but through the Bernoulli effect, it pulls the sample through this whole baffling system. It's nebulized and ultrasonic frequency, and you get all these tiny little bubbles. Remember all this? And it's pulled into the flame. Well, the speed of the, like, that gas blowing through into the burner head 
the speed of the actual fuel and oxidant mixture themselves. That is the, the burn velocity. And the idea here is, yeah, this is burning nice, but first off, it's the wrong mixture of what two things are mixing to make this flame? What's my fuel? What's my oxidant? The gas. Yeah, what's, yeah, the gas is the, according to this table, the gas is the fuel. What type of gas is it? Natural gas, which is just what? Starts with an M. Methane. OK. And they, you're not, you can't smell methane. That's why they insert those sulfur compounds in there so you know when there's a leak. Right? OK. So our fuel is methane for that little Bunsen burner. Our oxidant is air. OK, essentially oxygen in the air. But OK, so you want this, this mixture. And the mixture isn't quite right, because look, it's, it's so yellow. So we need to get increase the oxidant. There, now it's starting to look better, right? OK. But notice how it's kind of jumping around. The flame's kind of jumping around. So it's, this is, it's, it's got some burn velocity going right now. There's some speed of the, of the methane coming through this tube, centimeters per second. But it, it could be better. If we could make it so it's more stable flame, all right, get this mixture going so we have a really nice, oh. <laughs> See, now that burn velocity was too high because the flame went out, right? So I went over it. So there's a, there's a happy region in here is what I'm trying to get at for these burn, this burn velocity. It's just the, the flow rate of the gas. That's all it is. So there's a happy region where you get this nice, steady flame. So if you have it going too fast, it just blows out. But if you have it going too slow, can you imagine the flame just going down into here? Yeah. Then if it gets down into here inside the burner head, especially if you remember the nebulizers coming up in this area and you have all these baffles and things. It starts with an F. It's not the bad word either if this happens. <laughs> what back? What happens if that, if that gas actually comes down into here? Oh, yeah, that's a it's a bad thing. Flashback. flashback. You get this explosion, right? So if your burn velocity is too low, that's not a good thing. You'd rather have it too high so the thing just goes out. But like I said, there's supposed to be all these safety features in there that'll protect you. Okay, I think it's off. So that's an idea of what burn velocity is. There's a happy, happy speed that will give you a nice stable flame. Okay, so you get this nice stable flame. You you picked your fuel and your oxidant, and you've got it going at the right speed. You've got this nice burner head. You know, when I say burner head, I'm talking about this guy, right? The guy with that silver slit. We have a picture of it somewhere. Down here, there's a burner head. Okay. Components of the flame. It has some different names. Did you catch this in the reading? Man, you've got a photographic memory if you got this. There's the primary combustion zone. You only have three of these. Primary combustion zone, probably which arrow? It's actually the very first one, where it comes in first, right? Because your oxidant's coming up here, and your fuel. So this is the primary combustion zone. OK. Then there's the secondary combustion zone. Yeah, I would guess the next one, but it's not. <laughs> it's the top one. The secondary combustion zone. And then the last one is called the interzonal region. OK, now you've, you've seen this. Now we can actually name these now. Let's see, let's see if I can get this going again. But you have to have a nice, steady flame to see the parts. Ah, oh, it's going too fast again. I don't know. OK. See, if you get a 
going at a nice, see if you have it messed up, you can't really see the, the different regions, All right? Now it's starting to get easier to see. Can you see where the, I don't want to use my pen. Do you see where the <laughs> primary combustion zone tops out right about there, right? Okay, do you remember in general chemistry, you want to get out as fast as possible, you had to boil some water. Where did you put the beaker in the flame? Did you set it way up here? Did you set it way, where was the hottest spot in that flame? Do you remember? Uh-uh. You guys, it's the very, and you can, you can go by this table. Look at the, the, the plot is probably the way to go if you don't believe what I say, right? It's going to be where? Where is the hottest spot, hottest spot in that flame? Yeah, pretty much in the middle. Right at, I don't know where the tip of the primary combustion zone is, but it's going to be pretty much right around there either at the tip or just above the primary combustion zone. So that tip right there, right, that's the hottest spot. Oh, we just answered that one. Okay. In what region, so you've got three of them to pick from, Melissa, in what region of the flame is most spectroscopy performed? What would you say? Where? So in other words, when they say where's most spectroscopy performed, they're talking about where would you be shining the AA light through this thing, right? Would you be shining it through the primary, the interzonal region, or the secondary? Interzonal. I, interzonal, yeah. Cause I think uh, if see if we could get this better, it might be easier to see, but. There's a lot of temperature fluctuation out here by the secondary. Look at the flames out there. It's really, and it's really changing temperature really fast. The primary combustion zone is going from 130 degrees in a very short region, too. So there's a high change in temperature here. So it's kind of stable, right? You can almost see right through it optically. You can almost see right through it in the interzonal region. So pretty much, and it's hottest there. So pretty much the majority is done in that interzonal region. Okay. So if you say that it's the hottest in the interzonal, mm -hmm. the top. You said that the hottest is the interzonal, or the yeah, I would say the hottest is in the bottom of that interzonal region, right? According to this plot, it's kind of in the bottom to the middle of that interzonal region. Looks like the hottest to me. Or the tip of the primary. Yeah, I'm just not sure where the whoa where the tip of the primary combustion zone is in that plot. I don't know why it does that. I'd like to know why it does that often. Oh, I changed, I shut that off. Okay. So are we good? Element emission profiles in a flame. Are all atoms, now here's a plot. See how it says absorbance versus height in the flame, right? Okay. Are all atoms, Andy, measured at the same height in the flame? In fact, which atoms in there, which elements, would you want to be measuring really high in the flame? Magnesium, yeah, because look, that's where it absorbs the most. What else? Silver, yeah. Chromium, you'd want to measure where? 
the lowest height possible, right? Because look at that. It's close to the very tip of the burner head that you can get. Okay. So what the heck is going on here? I, to me, the key is this. The key is this. We are doing AA. We're not doing AI, or sorry, IA, ion absorption. No, we're doing atom absorption. You can't have ions. You can't have oxides. You can't have, you need, if you're studying calcium, it can't be calcium ion in the flame. That's not going to absorb your light. It can't be calcium oxide in the flame. Where are these oxides coming from? What's surrounding this whole flame? Oxygen. So oxides form really easily. In fact, that's what's going on with uh, chromium. Right when chromium enters that flame, it's forming oxides. So it's messed up. So why or why not? The reason is, is that's where this plot is really showing, yeah, it's showing absorbance, but it's really showing where, in what height in the flame are most of your atoms at. And the concentration of those atoms is going to be different depending on the element. Why? Because some, some ionize really easily. Some don't. Some form oxides really easily. Some don't. So their populations in that flame could, could very well vary. We've never messed with that. Right? We never messed with the height in the flame. We could have. We could have messed with all that stuff. We could have messed with the, the nebulizer flow rate and all that stuff. Okay? We could have messed with the voltage on the, on the lamp. We didn't do a lot of that stuff. Okay. Two deficiencies when using a flame as the atomizer. So this is what we use. Here's our flame. Can you think of one? You actually know what one of them is. In that, in that nebulizer assembly, most of our sample goes to where? Does it go up into the flame? It goes to waste. That's a, right? The far majority of sample goes to waste. So that's not good, especially if you're talking about sensitivity. Right? Everything, you're, not, you're losing most everything. Then the other one is, this one's kind of hard for you to know. I guess the only clue you have is there's this burn velocity. Like uh, 300 centimeters per second. I mean, one second, this gas flows 300 centimeters. That's, all, that's really going fast. That means once you do get it nebulized and you get your little droplets going all the way into through the Bernoulli effect, getting them into the flame, they're going to blow right out of there in no time. Because you've got a light path going through here. Typically, it's 0 0.1 milliseconds. 1 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds. That's the time, that's all the time you have. That the sample, well that the analyte is in the beam path. Let's use optical path because that would match the diagram I have below. I added this stuff and I just added this stuff in the morning. That's why it looks a little bit different than your notes. Okay, so the best atomizer that you can get, it's going to be around $80,000, and we didn't buy this. The best atomizer you can get is that of a graphite furnace, which uses electrothermal atomization. What's that? So here's a diagram of a graphite furnace. And this whole thing is a, is a tube, kind of like a quartz tube. And you put your sample in there. It heats the crud out of it. So there is no flame, right? Just by heating it up, What's the word going from a solid to a gas? It vaporizes, yeah, but sublime is the best word, right? So it, and it doesn't go anywhere. You heat it up, and it stays in the optical path. There's, there's none of this, oh, 0.1 millisecond of being in the optical path. No, it's in there as long as you want. Heat it up even more, longer. Okay. The problem is, I think, with this is, well, it costs a lot more. But also, these tubes cost like 20 bucks a shot. So it, it really, for an educational purpose, it really brings up the cost of running this stuff. At least there's no gases, though. No flashback possibility. Be kind of nice.
even though that's never happened. Light sources for atomic absor absorption spectroscopy. Currently, there's a different lamp used for each metal when doing a spectroscopy. Is that true or false? True. That's true. So that, why, not, why not just use a monochromator? Right? Get this you know, cheap old flashlight or fine xenon arc lamp or something. Get a nice big lamp that shows all the colors. Put a monochromator in front of it. And oh, sodium's at 550 nanometers. So you turn the little monochromator 550 nanometers, shine out sodium light. I mean, light's light, right? You'd be rich. Why hasn't anyone done it? It's, a, it's, it's hard to, it's really hard for you to see, but I would make the statement first. Let's make the statement first. That bandwidth of the absorption Bandwidth of absorption must be bigger than the bandwidth of the light source. OK, so that's the statement. But let's see if we can make sense out of it. When I say bandwidth, on a monochromator, I'm talking about the what on the monochromator? The, the slit width, right? So because that, because you make that slit really narrow, and then it's even fewer nanometers. Okay, so y you get that monochromator set with the narrowest slit width. Okay, and you, let's say you do that, then your bandwidth. Here's this is wavelength. This is intensity your bandwidth is going to look like this. And it could be, you know, it's going to look like that. Okay, so with the, from a monochromator. But what do the, what does it, what do these, what does it, the light look like that comes out of an, what does the AA absorb, these atoms, their absorption spectrum or their emission spectrum? Do they look like that? They were gases, so they're just lines. So the absorbance signal is this, though. So here's our wavelength. All right, maybe you can, you can pick a line. But, and remember absorption, you have a background, incident intensity, you have some what gets through. You compare those two intensities and you get the absorbance signal, take the negative log of it. Well, you can't detect it. If you, try to take this absorption signal out of that, what would the transmitted light look like? Right? Wavelength. I mean, maybe you might see a little bump. <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to be able to detect it. I mean, I really blew it up. You, you can't see the change in intensity. It's too small. So the only thing you can do, you can use to monitor the, uh, the absorption signal of gaseous atoms is light generated from gaseous atoms. Because then your, in, your incident intensity looks just like this. So those, little, those line intensities can go up and down. It's much easier to measure. You, can't, you can measure it then okay, in a very sensitive way. So that's why nobody does it. So here's a, an AA lamp. It's all wrapped up because, you know, if you drop it, it'll glass could go places. But here's a cathode, hollow cathode lamp. So we said that we have a different lamp for every metal. Okay. The cathode is covered with the blank of interest. What would you say? It's probably since we're studying, if we want to look for calcium, the ca with the metal. If you're going to look for, if you want a calcium lamp, the cathode's going to have calcium metal on there. Mercury, it'll have mercury metal. Okay.
Why is it cylindrical? Well, let's answer this question first. How does it generate this light in the first place? Okay, so the cathode has the metal of interest on it. Inside this, inside this uh, tube, this lamp, is an inert gas. Inert means just won't react. Argon, xenon, whatever, right? So what they're going to do is just by atoms colliding with atoms, right, these, let's call it argon, they get, argon, I kind of picture of this, these, neo, these noble gases as just like a sphere, and there's no, they're not polar or anything, right, shouldn't they just be a sphere with a nucleus and a, an elect, cloud of electrons around them? Okay, but what would happen if one argon atom collided with another argon atom? Right, that distribution of electrons should shift a little bit, right? And the instant it does, that's called an instantaneous dipole. The instant it does, man, it's going to slam into the cathode because this has a huge charge on it, huge voltage. There's a huge voltage difference between the anode and the cathode. So once two of these argon, or the argon could slam into the, the glass side. Whatever, the point is that it gets an instantaneous dipole. Once that happens, it slams into the cathode. It's called sputtering. Why? Because it's going to sputter out and kick out calcium atoms, if that's the metal that's on the cathode. And these calcium atoms are now in the gas phase. Man, you got just what you want. You've got calcium atoms in the gas phase at a really high energy. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to emit their light. Hopefully, land back where so it can all happen again land back on the, uh, the calcium atoms, redeposit back onto the cathode. So that's the sputtering process. You've got this inert gas at a really low pressure, right? They naturally, just through natural collisions, they're going to get an instantaneous dipole. This huge voltage applied across the anode and the cathode causes those argon atoms to slam into the cathode. Sputtering occurs. The metal of interest is kicked into the gas phase. Right? And it emits its light. Hopefully it lands back down onto the cathode so it can all happen again. The reason for this, these cathode lamps being cylindrical is that they're trying to get that redeposition to occur so those lamps will last longer. But they don't. They last like a couple years and then they're, they're shot and you got to go buy some new ones. Okay. Oh. So, uh, this is kind of, I hate playing with this, but this, this is to generate, to show that kind of sputtering idea. <laughs> so, so you can, I don't know if you can, you can picture, but with this high voltage, you have a high gas slamming into the cathode, right, and atoms will get kicked out of there, okay. So, but it gets a really nice arc, doesn't it? Where's the sound coming from? Well, not really exploding. They're when they slam back, because the air is an ins air is a great insulator. So the when the air slams back after that arc goes across, after that current goes across, when the air slams back, yeah, that's the that's the sound you're hearing. I hate that thing. All right. Interferences, spectral interferences. This is rare. So you're studying for calcium. You know that absorbs at 550 nanometers, 550.25 nanometers, right? So you have the lamps, the AA, uh, calcium lamp put in there, 552 nanometers, right, or whatever we we're looking at. But there's something else in the sample that also absorbs at 552 nanometers, that line. So there's two metals that have the exact same absorbance. It's rare, though. So the fix is this off, this background correction button that you can push. That doesn't happen very often. The more common interference, it's still an interference is something that's going to give you the wrong answers, right? Either your answers are too high or too low, even though they shouldn't be. Your sample's right there. So what could give reasons for signals that are too high or too low than what they should be? Those are called interferences. First one is spectral interference, where two metals have the exact same 
right, line, that's rare. More common is the chemical interference. A chemical present in the flame interacts with the metal to change the metal's absorbance spectrum. So, in fact, we had to do this. We had to add lanthanum to study what metal? Was it calcium? Sodium. Was it, I think it was sodium, wasn't it? We had to add lanthanum to all of our samples because there's a chemical interference. What we wanted to do is we want to suppress the ionization. We wanted to fill that flame with electrons so that the sodium, sodium just forms these sodium ions. Well, with all those electrons in the flame, it, that ionization is suppressed because sodium ion is going to have a different absorption than sodium atoms. Sodium ions aren't going to absorb. Your signal is all going to be too low. And if you don't add that lanthanum, all your analyses, oh, there's hardly any sodium here. Don't worry about it, Granny. Just go ahead and drink your water, <laughs> right? Even though you have diabetes, you're fine. You're good. No, you should have. You didn't do the analysis right. You needed, a, you needed to suppress that ionization by putting lanthanum in there. And oh, yeah, Granny, don't drink that water. There's a lot of sodium in there. Okay. <laughs> Calibration <laughs> curves. The calibration curves are not, well, I answered it. They're not linear. That's why you got to use a, a, a cookbook. I don't know where my pencil is. All right? They're not linear. That's why it's so important to use that AA cookbook. Follow all the directions, right? The slit width, all that kind of stuff. All right? So for, for particular concentration ranges, there's a slit width, and there's the line that you should use to get the most linear results. Double beam AA flame spectrophotometer. That's what we have. What two measurements need to be made if you're going to make an absorbance measurement? What were the two? They even have symbols for them in the diagram. Do you see the two? PR and P. Those are the two measurements you got to make, right? So you have this incident or this reference, and then what gets transmitted. So they're calling P the transmitted and R the, the reference or the, or the incident, what we called it. So the light paths, there's not really much to identify. You can kind of see how they're going. The point is, is they want them both measured simultaneously, because that's the whole purpose of this double beam spectrophotometer, is to account for fluctuations in what? In, well, not really. In, in getting these, these two intensity measurements, what could fluctuate in getting those two numerical signals? What could mess up? What changes? What fluctuates? Isn't it the... Is the lamp going to be perfect from the moment you turn it on to the moment you turn it off? Yeah, that's changing in fluctuation. You could have a fluctuation with just the voltage in the building. That's going to change. The detector, right? Its intensities. Those are the two easy ones. And I'm sure there's even more complicated stuff that can mess with your signals. So. The reason why you want to measure the reference and the incident at the exact same time is just that, because there's these fluctuations in intensity from the lamp and detector ability. The whole monochromator system's warming up and changing, the grading, right? So you want to measure these things instantaneously. That's the whole purpose of having a double beam in the first place. So you don't have to worry about those fluctuations. You can use this instrument from the time you turn it on. And there's none of these, OK, let's push a button for, you know, put a cuvette. Well, there's no cuvette. That's a bad example here for AA. All right. General AA hints. We're almost wrapping it up here. You increase the voltage. I added this. When you increase the voltage of the AA. Sounds like a really good thing, right? Because the light's going to be brighter on that little calcium lamp that you're trying to look at. But if you do that, Doppler broadening increases. You just crank the voltage. Things are going to be moving even faster in there. And that is a disadvantage, right? That's a disadvantage. Light intensity output increases. That is an A what?
is actually an advantage because you're doing absorption spectroscopy, right? The, the brighter the light, the kind of, it's a lot easier to work with it. Inside the AA lamp itself, self-absorption increases. You've cranked up the voltage, so now you've, you're, the sputtering process is happening even more and more energetically. And yeah, energy is quantized, so the exact same wavelengths are coming out of that thing. But the intensity is higher because you have more, a higher concentration of these sputtered calcium atoms in the gas phase. But since there's so many of them, one calcium atom emits its light, but then another calcium atom is in the way and absorbs it. That's self-absorption. That is a disadvantage. So everything must be filtered. Calibration curves aren't linear, so follow the cookbook. So that's it.